postdoctoral fellow at Carnegie Institution of Washington's Department of Terrestrial Magnetism in Washington, D.C. And before that, at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, Brian earned his Ph.D. From planetary of, in planetary science from the University of Arizona's Lunar and Planetary Laboratory in Tucson, Arizona. He also does some planetary science field work, notably on Death Valley's racetrack playa and on terrestrial and Martian dust devils. Hmm. Please welcome Brian Jackson with Astronomy Before Galileo. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, well, thanks so much for coming out, folks. I really appreciate it. Um, it's always a pleasure to visit Stanley, uh, especially in the summer, because down in Boise it can get quite hot, as many of you may know. <laughs> Not too bad today, but it can be quite warm, and it has been very recently. Um, I'm going to talk a little today about uh, the history of astronomy. I, I want to preface all this by saying I'm not an expert in the history of astronomy, um, but that I do know some kind of uh, interesting stories. I'm going to tell you some of those fun stories here. Um, I have a lot of, of numbers and dates that I want to make sure to get right, so I'm going to stand back here, and if you see me looking down at my computer, it's because I'm trying to get the years right, so, so um, bear with me on that. Um, the presentation I'm going to give you right now is actually... Um, presentation I'm going to give you is actually live on my website, astrojack.com. So I'm an astronomer. My last name is Jackson, astrojack.com. I don't sell anything there, so that's what we're going to do. Um, but the presentation is actually posted there on, their, on, on the website. So if you see any videos or links that you want to follow up on, check out the website. Um, and if today, tonight is not enough astronomy for you, uh, Boise State has regular astronomy events uh, every month. So on the first Friday of every month, we host an astronomy event uh, where we'll host someone to give a lecture about some sort of astronomical research topic. And then if the weather is clear, we go up to the on-campus observatory and do stargazing. So if you have uh, the first Friday of a month free and you're looking for like maybe a cheap date or something, this is the place to go because it's, it's totally free. It opens to the public. I've got some flyers actually over here on the table. Sarah was kind enough to let me put my flyers over there. So uh, please join us. Uh, the first one of these for the fall is going to be September 6th. And I'm going to give that lecture, and I'm going to talk about our work on dust devils. So if you want to hear about dust devils on Mars, and Saturn's moon Titan, and maybe some dust devils on the Earth, um, come to that lecture. Uh, so this is a, a, a portrait of Galileo uh, showing his telescope off to uh, officials of the Vatican uh, back in the early 1600s. Um, Galileo famously had this red beard. It, it, pictures of him when he's older show him kind of gray, of course, but he actually was, was a redhead, so he had this kind of fiery red beard and hair. Um, he was kind of a fiery personality on his own. Uh, he was the first uh, scientist to take a telescope and actually point it up. Um, the telescope uh, was invented before 1608, um, and the first patent on the telescope was filed um, by uh, this fellow Lippershey, uh, who was a, a Dutch uh, uh, engineer, optical engineer, he filed this patent, but it's not clear that he invented the telescope. So we don't actually know exactly who invented the telescope. But once his patent was filed, word of the, the telescope's design uh, kind of filtered throughout Europe. And uh, down in Italy, or the Italian states, uh, Galileo kind of adopted this and began experiments with the telescope. The principles of optics weren't all that well understood at the time, and so he actually conducted a variety of experiments using the telescope and looking at, at things that were far away on the ground just to confirm to himself that it wasn't distorting the image of something. It was actually showing him what was truly there. Um, and then at some point in 1609, he pointed the telescope up at the sky, which is something no one had done before. Up until that point, the telescope was actually just used to sight ships uh, coming into harbor. And you can imagine that if you were a merchant who'd invested in a ship, um, it was, it was uh, quite beneficial uh, financially to know when a ship was coming in hours before anyone else knew the ship was coming in. And so folks actually used telescopes to track ships at sea initially. Um, Galileo was the first to point it, point it up. Oh, and another interesting fact about Galileo. So, so the, as I said, the, the first patent on the telescope was filed in 1608 up in, uh, up in the Netherlands. Um, uh, Galileo adopted the telescope and kind of helped to popularize it. And he never 
exactly said that he invented it, but he kind of let people think that he had invented it. So if you've ever heard that Galileo invented the telescope, it's because it's he was trying to fool everyone into thinking that. <laughs> and he, of course, Galileo's uh, first observations were just fantastic, and they were just revolutionary. They changed our thinking about the universe. Um, this is a sketch that he had uh, drew, uh, which was published in 1610, which shows Jupiter, that large circle in the middle of each of those panels is Jupiter, surrounded by four or sometimes three little, little dots. Okay, that's Jupiter and, and uh, its largest four satellites, Io, Io Europa, uh, Callisto, and Ganymede. Um, those satellites um, clearly orbited Jupiter, and that was a revelation because at the time Galileo was doing his work, uh, everyone thought that the sun and all the planets orbited the Earth. But this was clear evidence that there was something that was not orbiting the Earth. These, uh, these satellites clearly orbited Jupiter. And so this is one of the, the, the key pieces of evidence uh, that established what we now refer to as the heliocentric theory for the solar system, and I'll come back to that later. Um, but these observations were really revolutionary. And I, there was one other thing I was going to tell you. Oh, yes. Yeah, so Galileo was, was uh, 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 an astronomer in a time that there was no public funding for astronomy. There wasn't like he could apply to the National Science Foundation in Italy and ask for a grant. So the way he funded his research was through wealthy patrons. And one uh, family that was particularly helpful to him was the Medici family uh, in Venice. And so he, um, he named these satellites when he discovered them. He named them the Medician stars initially. So the Galilean satellites, as we refer to them now, were originally called the Medician stars. And then everyone decided decades later, no, no, that's ridiculous. We're going to call them Galilean because he was the one who discovered them. And so um, before Galileo pointed his telescope at the, at the sky, of course, people had been doing astronomy for a long time. Thousands of years people had been doing astronomy, um, but they had been doing naked eye astronomy. So they'd been looking at the night sky and just using their eyes to see what they could. Um, and so they'd actually learned quite a lot. And I'm going to talk about the astronomy we understood before Galileo came along. Um, but it's important to understand why pointing a telescope at the night sky was, such a, was a revolutionary thing. Um, and in order to understand that, it helps to know exactly what a telescope does. So I'm not going to, I'm a physics professor, and so of course I, I'm, I'm want, uh, apt to, to, to wander into physics lectures, but I promise this will not be a physics lecture. Um, so this, this cartoon shows you um, kind of the basic design for a telescope. So a telescope usually has a big, a big lens at the front of the, of the telescope, and then light comes in through a tube, that's called the optical tube assembly. Light rays come down the tube, and then they are focused down at the back of the telescope where there's an eyepiece. And different telescopes have different designs, but, but they all do basically the same thing. Telescopes make dark things look brighter okay, by gathering more light than your eyeball can, and they make small things look bigger. Okay? So they make dark things look brighter, you make small things look bigger, and you can see why that would be useful if you're looking at things in the night sky that are really far away. Those things that are really small that you can't see with your naked eye, in many cases you can see them with the telescope because they make them brighter and bigger. Um, modern CCD cameras that we use in astronomy, actually we, we attach them to the back of the telescope and then we can take images of what we're seeing through the telescope. And that's how most modern astronomy observational work is done nowadays, is by sticking a camera at the back instead of an eyepiece of the telescope. Um, but in Galileo's day, and for a long time actually, folks were sketching what they saw through their, through their telescope. And so that was very useful for recording what was seen, but of course there was all this subjectivity that came into the sketches. Um, that subjectivity has, has more or less been removed by these sort of CCD observations. Um, so that astronomy has really been revolutionized by the invention of these kinds of instruments. And so in terms of making dark things look brighter and big things look, small things look bigger, um, telescopes have, have, have had this amazing uh, effect on our understanding of the universe. They've helped us to find planets and other solar systems. So this is a cartoon on the left showing the Hubble Space Telescope. Probably many of you recognize that. Um, and on the right, we see a cartoon of an extrasolar system that was observed by the Hubble Space Telescope. This is a, a, a system that famously has been suggested to have a moon in it. So this may be the first extrasolar moon. This planetary system is very unusual, though, because the planet itself, which looks like that kind of pink, brownish thing, is about the size of Jupiter. And if it exists, which we don't know for sure that it does, but if it exists, its moon is about the size of Neptune. So this is a planet, this is an object the size of Neptune in orbit around Jupiter. If that moon were in orbit around the sun, around its star, we just call it a planet. But 
but in this case it orbits a, a, its own planet potentially, and so it, it's called a moon. Uh, the observational data that, that suggests the presence of this moon are shown at the bottom panel down there. You can see the little, a little snow of dots and the red lines there. That big dip in the middle of that panel, that dip is the shadow of this planet as it passes between the Earth and its star. This is what's called a transit. Um, and so we can see the shadow of this planet as it passes in front of its star, and that's what tells us that we see the planet there. It tells us how big the planet is, it can tell us how many, how, how fast the planet goes around the star. Um, and just to give you a sense for how, how small that signal is, it's, it's about the same uh, change in brightness you would get as having a bumblebee fly in front of a, a football stadium light. So if you were to point a, you know, a, a camera at a stadium and look for a bumblebee flying in front of that light, that's about the difficulty we have in trying to find this planet in front of its star. And if you look just to the, on the right-hand side of that, that plot, you can just begin to see another, maybe that's, that's a dip there. That, we think, potentially is the dip of the, the satellite as it passes in front of the star uh, in its orbit around the planet. Okay, so this is, we've observed this in trouble. Now, I will say, before you walk away from this talk, um, this is a very controversial discovery right now. It's still, folks are debating whether this, this satellite actually exists, but we know for sure the planet does. And we actually know of thousands thousands of planets in other solar systems now. So these are planets that orbit stars tens and even hundreds of light years from the Earth. So there are more planets known outside of our solar system than there are in our solar system. And if you've paid attention over the last several decades, you'll notice that the number of planets in our solar system has been dropping with time. <laughs> the number of planets outside have been <laughs> So we can, make, we can make dim things look brighter with telescopes. Uh, we can make small things look bigger. Um, and one really important uh, observation that's been made in the last, and is be continuing to be made in the next several years, uh, are those observations are being collected by the European Space Agency's Gaia mission. So this is a, an artist's illustration of what the Gaia uh, spacecraft looks like. This is in orbit around the sun, and what this spacecraft does is it stares at the uh, stars in the sky over the course of its orbit around the sun, and as the, the spacecraft orbits the sun, of course, during one part of its orbit, it's on one side of the sun, and then on the other side of its orbit, it's on the other side of the sun. And so this generates what's called a parallax uh, motion, parallactic motion of stars in the sky. Okay? If you um, hold your finger out in front of you, everyone can do this right now, you can hold your finger out in front of you, and you blink closed one eye, and then you cl blink close the other eye, you'll notice that your finger moves back and forth against the background. That's called parallactic motion. And the distance, the amount by which the, your finger moves back and forth, that tells your brain how far away your finger is from your eyeball. Okay, we actually use our two eyes. This is why you have depth perception, is because your brain processes the image that is slightly out of alignment between the two eyeballs and figures out how far away things are based on how much they're moving back and forth between your eyeballs. The Gaia mission does exactly the same thing, except the distance between its two eyeballs is the size of its orbit. And so as it orbits the sun, it can see the stars drifting back and forth a teeny, teeny amount uh, and actually use that to determine the distance to stars. And um, the Gaia mission is, has or will determine the distance to, to almost a billion stars, I think, in our galaxy. Almost a billion stars. And I'm going to show you a really neat uh, video which will hopefully load um, here. Let's see if I can get this to work. This is going to be hard from here. Hang on a second. seeing here is in a very blurry form which may hopefully will clear up in a second um, you're seeing the stars parallactic motion that, that the Gaia mission was observing but greatly magnified greatly greatly magnified to your eyeball if you were in orbit with the spacecraft you would not see this motion it would be much too small for you to see with your eyeball but the spacecraft can see it um, eventually you'll get a high resolution version this is a really neat uh, this is a really neat video because you can actually uh, move around in the video Oh. There we go. <laughs> oh. 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 
this, this is a video that's live on YouTube. You can just navigate through this video and look around the sky and see how far away the stars are as determined by the uh, Gaia mission. So this is what telescopes have done for us. Make things, make dim things bright, and small things big. But of course, for thousands of years, humans did not have access to this technology. Humans did not have access to this technology, but they were still doing astronomy. And one of the most uh, prolific uh, astronomical cultures was the, were the Egyptians. So in ancient Egypt, um, we have uh, records dating back to at least 3000 BC. So the Egyptian culture existed at least back that far, and almost definitely farther than that, because they had a written language in 3000 BC. So that means their culture had to exist before that. Um, it's a series of dynasties along the Nile River, of course. That's where the nice fertile farmland was, and the desert there. Um, you can see three of the great pyramids in this picture. Um, and each of these pyramids is associated with a particular pharaoh. And uh, these, these pyramids were built by hired help. This is an interesting myth. The, the pyramids were not built by slaves. They were actually um, farmers that were hired by the dynasty to come out and build these things. The pyramids took about 10 or 20 years to build, which actually is amazing and it took so short. <laughs> they built something that big, but they did. They got really good at this. Um, and uh, the pyramids were the tombs for the rulers, of course. And the sides of the pyramids very nearly face the cardinal directions. And this is really important in the, the religion of the Egyptians that they do this because, because of all the stuff that the pharaoh was going to have to do in the afterlife. Um, the sides of the pyramids very nearly face the cardinal directions. Um, and they face the cardinal directions to within one degree. One degree. That's a really tiny... I mean, your finger held out uh, from the distance of your hand, that's, that's, uh, less, that's a little bit more than a degree. So you can imagine building an enormous structure like this to a precision of one degree and less. That's an amazing achievement. But the pyramids are not exactly aligned to the cardinal directions. They're offset by a little bit, um, depending on where they, where, which pyramid you're looking at. Um, the, the orientation appears to drift by about half a degree per century. So we know that the pyramids were built, we know the order in which the pyramids were built based on the texts inside of them, because different pyramids will refer back to previous rulers. So you can figure out the order in which the pyramids were built, and you see that if you make a plot of the order in which they're built, that their orientation sort of drifts slowly over the course of the centuries. So this is a bit of a puzzle. Why, why would that happen? They could get it to within one degree, but then they got it wrong every 10, 20 years. What was happening was the Earth was drifting. So there's an effect on the rotation axis of the Earth called precession. And we actually see this effect in uh, tops. There's a cartoon showing a top. If you get a top spinning, um, you'll notice that the tip of the top will actually rotate around like this. And the reason the tops do that is because the gravity of the Earth actually tugs on them and, and induces a torque that spins them around. Um, the Earth, of course, is subject to this gravity from the sun and the moon. This causes the Earth's axis to drift as well. The drift of the axis for the Earth is, it takes place over the course of 26,000 years, so it's very slow. But if you're building pyramids over hundreds of years, you're going to start to notice it. It will start to affect your architecture. And so we can actually um, work out the dates, the approximate dates at which different pyramids were built based on the orientation that we see, because we can work back to what the, uh, where the polar axis of the Earth was pointing at a certain time and figure out when the polar axis is pointed in the right direction to explain the pyramid's orientation that we see. And just to show you what that looks like, here's, the, here's a map showing the, the uh, circle of precession that the Earth makes over the course of 26,000 years. So, you know, it's just about the year 2000. And so the, the polar axis of the Earth points just about there, very close to Polaris, the North Star, okay? So we're lucky right now that, that the Earth's North Polar Axis actually points very close to the North Star in the sky, but that's not always true. You can see that thousands of years ago, the Egyptians were building up there was no star close to the North Pole, no bright star close to the North Pole, and so it was difficult for them to determine North. They didn't have a star to point to. <laughs> but they were clearly building a pyramids to pretty high precision. So, so how were they doing that? Um, they actually used, uh, we think, we don't know for sure, but this is what we think they did, was that they would hang a very long plumb line uh, on a scaffold, so they knew which direction was exactly down. And they would wait for different stars rotating in the sky to transit that plumb line. And when you had the right set of stars that transited that plumb line, so 
pointing straight down toward the center of the Earth, they knew that that direction was north. But of course, this is going to drift over the years as the precession of the Earth moves the rotation axis. Okay. And so again, Egyptians, even without telescopes, were doing very, very precise astronomy, and they had this astronomy was very important for their uh, religious ceremonies and their religious beliefs. Now, a lot of, uh, of Egyptian astronomy was later uh, adopted uh, by the Babylonians. And there was some overlap, I think, here. Um, excuse me, the Babylonians came way before, uh, way before the Egyptians. There, there, was a, there was some overlap, I, I should say. Um, the Babylonians also did very high, highly precise astronomy, observational astronomy. They made these pegboards, one of them is shown over there, where they would keep track of different um, dates of the year. They'd move this peg from one slot to the next. And next to each of these little pegs, uh, peg holes, there would be a description of what was supposed to happen on that date. The Babylonians kept these really, over the course of, of centuries, they kept these very, very meticulous records of what was going on in the night sky on a particular date and what happened on the Earth. So for instance, they'd say, oh, the king died when Mars was in retrograde near, uh, near Orion. And so therefore, whenever Mars goes into retrograde near Orion, the king better be careful because he might be in danger. And they would use these, these records going back hundreds of years to warn the king to basically tell the royalty what things to worry about, when a war was going to come, when famine was going to come. Um, they had no understanding of the causation between these things. right? They just had these long records and highly, highly precise uh, observations of where stars and planets were in the night sky over hundreds of years. But they didn't know what caused any of that. And interestingly, the Babylonians and the Egyptians, they didn't care what caused any of that. They were not interested in sort of natural even supernatural causation explanations for these phenomena. They just made records and kept very careful track of these things, but they weren't interested in why things were happening the way they were. Eventually, a lot of this uh, astronomy, these records, came into possession of the, of the ancient Greeks, um, and they began to, to uh, explore all this Egyptian and Babylonian astronomy. A lot of this spread throughout the Greek islands and the Mediterranean there. Um, but the Greeks started to become interested in naturalistic explanations for these phenomena. They wanted to know not just what was going to happen, but why it was happening. Um, and of course, modern science didn't exist at the time, so they didn't have the sort of uh, very strong philosophical basis for, for doing uh, phil uh, scientific predictions. But they could notice phenomena. They could reason. They, they, they did a lot of talking in Greece. Um, and at some point, uh, they began to sort of mechanize the celestial motion. Because if you watch the night sky for a long time, for long enough, you'll notice these regular motions of the night sky. And so they began to sort of categorize and systematize these motions. Um, this is a depiction of, of one idea the Greeks had about the cosmology of the universe and the construction of things. So at the bottom of this picture, we have the Earth. That's where we are, at the very bottom of everything. Uh, above that, we have the, the layer of fire. So this is the Aristotelian element fire. Um, the Greeks believed that the, the universe was made out of five different elements. Right? There was, there was fire, there was earth, there was water and there was air. Um, and then there was a fifth element that, was, that made up the heavens. And those layers corresponding to the heavens are the layers above the fire layer. Okay? And as you go up in the different layers, uh, you'll see uh, the stars and the planets. And at the very top is, is, is the heavens where the gods are. Okay? And so they began to sort of construct these kind of layered cosmologies about where different uh, features in the sky uh, lived. Um, this, all this sort of systemization of, of celestial motions uh, culminated in what's called the um, uh, geocentric model for the solar system. And so this geocentric model basically posits that the sun and all the planets are in orbit around the Earth, circling the Earth. And, and who wouldn't think that, right? If you watch the night sky, everything's moving around in circles. You don't feel like you're moving, right? So, so it's very natural to assume that everything's moving around the Earth. Um, and so this, uh, this geocentric model, so that means geo means Earth, centric means center, so the Earth at the center, uh, originated between sort of 300 and 200 BC. We don't actually know exactly where it came from or who put it together. Um, it probably developed over the course of many decades, but people connecting up different observations. Um, and it made some very helpful predictions. It turns out that you can actually do a really good job of predicting the positions of planets and stars in the sky by assuming that they circle the Earth. And uh, that model was, was uh, 
that model for, for their emotions was, was eventually famously systematized by Ptolemy in his, in his book called The Almagas, which was written in 150 BC, or sorry, 150 AD. Um, and that picture of the planets and stars revolving around the Earth dominated astronomical thinking for 1,700 years, a really long time. The biggest reason that it, that it dominated it, it was because it was so successful at predicting the positions of planets and stars. You could go into the Almagest and use Ptolemy's uh, system of calculating positions of planets, and sure enough, it was pretty accurate to tell you almost exactly where Mars was going to be you know, in, a, in, in 10 years from now. But of course, uh, uh, eventually, these predictions started to get out of sync with what we were observing in the night sky. And this mismatch between the observational predictions from Ptolemy from 150 AD and what was actually being observed by astronomers in the 16 and 1700s, that began to tell them that there was something rotten at the core of this, this model. Um, but as I said, it's, it's very easy to see why you would be confused and think everything was revolving around the Earth. One other piece of evidence uh, that was missing for showing us that the Earth was actually in motion around the Sun, astronomers had been looking for a long time for stellar parallax. So that parallactic motion I showed you earlier from the Gaia mission, those parallactic motions are very, very small. And astronomers knew, ancient astronomers, Greek astronomers, knew that if the Earth were in motion around the Sun, the stars ought to be drifting back and forth in the night sky. We ought to be able to see that parallactic motion. And people had looked for hundreds of years and not seen it. And so they assumed, well, that, that's, that's clear evidence that the Earth is not moving relative to the stars. Um, and it took until... Uh, 1800s, 1838, before the first parallactic uh, observations were made. Uh, and the stars that were observed were the cl very closest stars to the Earth, the stars that would exhibit the largest parallactic motion. And for a long time, just a handful of stars, like two or three stars, could actually be seen to exhibit this parallactic motion. The vast majority of stars are so far away, we don't see any motion at all. So the Greeks began to systematize our cosmology. Um, they also had this wealth of, of <coughs> observational data from the Babylonians and, and the Egyptians um, who, who had made very accurate predictions about when different solar eclipses were going to take place. And this is a map showing solar eclipses. I don't know if you can read the labels there. Oh, yeah, you can. Um, oh, it doesn't show, the, doesn't show the eclipse that just happened, does it? <laughs> no, in fact, the reason for it is, is this, these are eclipses from a very particular sequence of eclipses, the Saros, which I won't talk about, but um, the, the eclipse that happened two years ago was not part of this sequence, that's why the, that eclipse doesn't appear. But um, you can make very accurate predictions about when the eclipse is, when and where the eclipses are going to take place, without even understanding what's going on physically, just looking at the cycles of eclipses. And so um, the Greeks began to put this all this story together, and, and made some really amazing predictions, both on paper, but also mechanistically. They actually developed these very sophisticated machines to make predictions about where and when eclipses would take place, when the lunar phases would occur. Um, very famously, there's a, a mechanism called the Antikythera mechanism, which was discovered in a shipwreck in 1900 AD, you know, not, not that long ago, 200, you know, 100 years ago. Um, and it was this, you can see a picture of it right here, this sort of grime encrusted set of gear workings that was not well understood for almost 50 or 60 years. Eventually, we developed the technology to, to conduct high-resolution x-rays and CAT scans of this instrument, and it became clear that it was a series of complicated interlocking gear works. And so over the course of a few decades, um, uh, folks who studied ancient astronomy and ancient uh, machines were able to piece together that this was actually a, an ancient planetarium, that you could wind the, the uh, mechanism on one side and see motions of the planets and the stars over the course of, of many, many decades. This is actually used as a teaching tool to teach uh, students how the stars and the planets move through the sky. It showed uh, various predictions such as uh, solar eclipses, but it'll also tell you when the Olympic Games were happening and where. Um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating instrument. I, I, I have a video here, I'm not gonna show it to you, um, but, but I, I would suggest going to the website and checking out this video. Um, they've reconstructed how this thing works and actually made models of it so we can actually watch it in operation. Um, we don't know exactly when it was built, but, but um, some of the dating that has been done suggests that it might go back to Archimedes. So it's not impossible this was designed and built by Archimedes, but it, whoever it was, was 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 a genius and clearly a very gifted machinist. So the Greeks were doing really great work and helping us to understand or at least systematize the motion of stars and planets in the sky. 
uh, you know, and then everything fell apart. <laughs> the Dark Ages happened. Of course, the Roman Empire took over for a while, um, uh, but but then it fell apart. Um, the the end of the world began in uh, 476 A.D. Um, through a series of, of basically the government was falling apart. You had people, uh, you know, invading, and, and Rome had basically spread itself too thin, trying to conquer the world, and so eventually the the empire fell apart. And all these important records of Greek, Egyptian, and Babylonian astronomers. Um, were lost to the Western world. Were lost to the Western world. What happened to them? A lot of them made their way into the Muslim world. So they made their way into the Middle East. So these records were actually picked up by uh, Muslim scholars for, for, for centuries. And so the Islamic scholars actually at this time, just after the fall of Rome, they saved all this astronomical work and actually built on it, began to build on it more and make more detailed predictions and more... Uh, uh, um, observations, but, but no significant progress was made in astronomy during the Dark Ages. During these Dark Ages, really what people were doing was copying down the manuscripts over and over and over. And if you wanted to be a, a scientist, or at the time you, know, might re you would refer to as a natural philosopher, what you did was copy these predictions over and over and over. Um, they, they weren't doing new work, they were just copying these predictions. Um, but there was, there was light at the end of the tunnel. Um, Eventually, the Black Death came, <laughs> swept through Europe. There was some, some bad things that happened, of course, too. Um, the Black Death came through uh, and swept through Europe between uh, 1348 and 1350 and killed maybe as many as 60% of Europe's total population. I mean, more than half. A lot of people died. Millions of people died. Um, this was bad, of course. <laughs> um, but, but good things that came out of this, actually, is it reduced the... It reduced the requirements for, for food. So up until this point, there had been limited food, there had been limited resources all throughout Europe, and it was very hard for anyone to kind of make a living. But when this, this plague wiped out almost half of Europe, suddenly there was all this uh, land and material that was available to the survivors. And actually there was an economic renaissance that, that, be, that preceded the scientific renaissance of the 14 and 1500s, probably partly catalyzed by this, by this black plague. Um, and those uh, important astronomical records, which had been saved and preserved in the Islamic world, eventually made their way back to Europe because uh, uh, Constantinople fell in 1453. And that was one of the places where these records were kept. But when, the, when Constantinople fell, all these ancient astronomers, all these people who had been studying ancient astronomy, escaped. They basically ran to Europe where things had finally calmed down from the Black Plague. And so that material began to filter its way back into the Western world where scientists, natural philosophers, began to learn about it again. That catalyzed an enormous amount of scientific work and, and uh, astronomical uh, theorizing. Um, I, of course, I can't talk about all that here, um, but one person who was especially affected by these ideas was, um, was Copernicus, whose picture is shown here. He's kind of a stern-looking guy, isn't he? <laughs> a stern-looking guy. It's a nice haircut, though. <laughs> he must have very nice hair. Um, uh, Copernicus uh, was a, uh, uh, actually he became a lawyer, um, but his first love was astronomy. He really wanted to be an astronomer. He wasn't a very good astronomer though, truth be told. Um, he had some kind of crazy ideas that, that maybe the Earth and all the planets actually revolved around the Sun, instead of the planets and the Sun revolving around the Earth. Um, he had some very abstract reasons for this, to be honest, that, that don't make a whole lot of sense to modern astronomy. Um, I won't. I won't belabor that. But but he predicted that he suggested that maybe yeah, all the the planets were revolving around the sun. Um, the problem was that he, he he wasn't able to make lots of specific predictions based on his model because uh, at the time, of course, there weren't calculators and computers around. And so if you wanted to calculate the position of objects in this night sky, um, you had to do a, a long series of very tedious mathematical calculations. Um, Copernicus, who, whose day job was, was law, didn't have the time to do these. And so his idea basically languished. His idea for a heliocentric solar system, so helio, the sun, centric at the center, sun at the center solar system, kind of languished for decades. He told friends about it, and they all thought, you know, his, his astronomy friends, oh, that's a neat idea. Could you write it down? Maybe make some predictions from it. Oh, I don't have time. Maybe I'll get to it at some point. Um, eventually, he was convinced by... Uh, let me see if I can get to it. Eventually, he was convinced by... Um, his astronomical friends, uh, in particular the mathematician Redicus, who convinced Copernicus to finally write down his ideas and publish them. Um, this is a technical drawing from that that diagram. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk about it. Um, 
Copernicus worked uh, for, for many years and finally got everything written up and began to get everything ready to publish by 1542. So 1542 rolls around. His book is, his book is about to, to drop. He's really excited. Then he has a stroke. He has a stroke in, in, uh, in uh, the winter of 1542 and remained comatose, um, basically bedridden until May of 1543 when, when a copy of his book was finally brought to him on his deathbed and laid in his dying hands. And he died, basically, just barely managing to see this book, um, De Revolutionibus. Um, but this, this book was really important, of course, because it was, it was the first sort of series of predictions, modern, relatively modern predictions, of what, would, what the stars and the, and the planets would look like if they were in orbit around the sun. Um, it didn't make very accurate predictions, as it turned out. It wasn't, more, it wasn't actually any more accurate than Ptolemy's predictions. So that, that was one thing, one of the reasons that astronomers didn't immediately leap on this idea. And one, one uh, astronomer who was especially prominent, who, who didn't believe Copernicus, was uh, Tycho Brahe. Tycho Brahe, this is a picture of him. Um, I don't know if you can see it in this picture. His nose might look a little funny. Tycho Brahe was kind of a hothead. Um, he, he wanted to be smarter than he actually was, um, and he was, he was famously irascible. While he was a student uh, studying mathematics, he got into a duel with another student over who was the best mathematician, and he lost his nose in a sword fight. So he actually, uh, after that, uh, he wore a golden nose. I don't, I don't know if it shows it in this picture here, but his, his nose is actually gold. This is later, but it years. Um, he, yeah, he was kind of a, kind of a carouser. Um, he was he was uh, Danish nobility, um, and he was very passionate about astronomy. And his his genius lay in designing astronomical instrumentation. Um, and at the time, astronomical instrumentation, of course, did not include telescopes. This is in the, 1500s, the 1550s. Um, but he was designing this really sophisticated astronomical uh, uh, observ observational equipment, um, which, were which was allowing him to sort of compare Ptolemy's predictions to what he was seeing in the night sky. And he began to notice these enormous discrepancies between where Ptolemy said an object should be in the night sky and where he actually observed it to be. So he started to get worried that something was wrong there. Um, the observation that kind of clinched it for him, that made him decide that he really wanted to pursue astronomy, was uh, this supernova, which appeared in 1572. So for those of you who don't know what a supernova is, this is when a star explodes, and it, and it can be very bright for, for months or even years sometimes in the night sky. So this, this supernova basically appeared out of nowhere and became very bright and, and persisted for weeks like this. Um, of course, Ptolemy and the ancient Greek astronomers had, had said that the heavens was, were, were unchanging and static, perfect. And so the fact that this, this, this star appeared out of nowhere um, really challenged that idea. And so Copernicus decided he wanted to pursue astronomy at that point. He built this um, observatory, which was actually quite modern. And this is a really neat uh, sketch of it you can see here. And he had all these, these laboratories underneath it uh, on an island um, uh, in Danish sound. He named this, uh, this observatory Uraniborg. Uraniborg. Um, and he built these enormous observational uh, edifices. This is a, I don't know if you can see, uh, this is the great armillary sphere. I won't go into the technical details of it, but you could use this basically to figure out exactly where in the sky an object was and then compare that to these predictions that Ptolemy had been measuring. Um, this is like 10 feet across. It's huge. It's huge. It doesn't exist anymore, of course, but sadly. Brahe had his own ideas about the way the solar system was constructed. He suggested, in fact, that, okay, yeah, the, the, all the objects uh, don't move around the Earth. In, instead, what happens is the planets move around the sun, and then the sun orbits the Earth. So that, that was his idea. And so he was really dedicated to trying to prove that this was the actual correct model for the solar system. And so he was collecting observations for decades to try to prove that the sun was orbiting the Earth, and all the planets orbited the sun. Um, He made a series of observations of comets, and he actually was able to measure parallaxes for comets and decide that these comets were actually coming in very close to the sun and heading, heading out past the sun. And so this is a really important observation because it showed us, again, that the, that the heavens were, were changing and that things could move in and out of the solar system, in and out of the solar system. And that didn't make any sense in, in, in terms of Ptolemy's model, who predicted that everything was, was sort of fixed and featureless. This directly challenged that idea. 
And so this in inspired Brahe to pursue astronomy even more, pursue his model uh, for the solar system. And eventually he hired a, a mathematician who was, who was much more brilliant than he was to help polish up and revise his observations um, because Brahe himself was not capable of doing the math. Uh, this mathematician who helped with his observations is uh, very, also very famous, Johannes Kepler. So Johannes Kepler was hired to come along and, and help him process these observations. Um, uh, Brahe actually died before he was able to see his, his ideas brought to fruition by Kepler, um, partly because uh, he and Kepler didn't get along very well. They had a, num a number of falling out. They were both pretty tough personalities. Um, but also because Brahe was, was quite a drinker. And he uh, famously, he died because um, he, was, he was at a party with the, uh, the Danish king. And it was, of course, very rude to stand uh, whenever the Danish king was seated. And so at one point, he needed to get up to use the bathroom. But the Danish king was seated, so he couldn't get up. And so he waited for hours and hours and hours to get up. And he never was able to. And supposedly, I don't know if this is true or not, actually. Supposedly, his bladder burst. His bladder burst. I think what happened is he had a bladder infection. Um, but he ended up dying uh, as a result of this infection. Um, and never managed to see his, his observations brought to, to fruition. Um, Kepler came along, and um, because Kepler was one of his assistants, he managed to gather up Brahe's observations and effectively steal them from Brahe's family. He stole them and escaped back to Germany with these observations that Brahe had collected over the course of decades, um, and eventually managed to show, based on Brahe's highly, highly precise observations, that the planets and the sun were not in orbit around the Earth, that in fact all of the planets orbited the sun, and that was the origin point for uh, the heliocentric theory, which, as it turns out, is the correct one. Um, Kepler's uh, 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 work was published in 1609, and he, he devised these two laws of planetary motion which describe exactly how planets moved around in their orbits uh, through the solar system. We still use these laws today. We use Kepler's laws for planetary motion today in modern astronomy, uh, 400 years later. Um, the very next year, after a Ke a Kepler published his laws for planetary motion, based on these naked eye observations from Brahe and others, the very next year is when Galileo pointed his telescope at the night sky for the first time and saw Jupiter's moons. And so we knew that Kepler was right. And so we kind of come full circle here. This is a, a picture. This is the uh, Hubble Ultra Deep Field. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. This is made uh, by the <coughs> Hubble spacecraft staring at a patch of the sky about the size of the moon for hours and hours and hours. Every single one of those blobs, that's not a star. It, each one of those blobs is a galaxy, billions of light years from the Earth. And so this, this story from the Egyptians to the Babylonians to the Greeks really culminates in an in, in observation like this, uh, which we can only make uh, as a result of, of that long, long series of, of efforts uh, by ancient astronomers and modern astronomers. Uh, and with that, I'll be happy to stop and take any questions. Thank you. Treat by what you've said, but wonder if we're missing hearing about the Mayans, the Chinese, and the Japanese. Yes, uh, please do not come away from this talk with the impression that no one else except uh, Europeans were doing astronomy. Um, there were folks all over the world doing astronomy that had very, very sophisticated astronomical systems. Um, folks in South America had uh, astronomical systems that were at least as complex as the Babylonians. Um, the Japanese had some astronomy, um, but it, interestingly it wasn't as sophisticated as in other parts of the world. Uh, a lot of, of uh, Eastern Asia had adopted um, Chinese astronomy, um, including the Japanese and the Koreans. Um, and so there's, there's an interesting story to tell there. I should actually bring my wife because she, she is Japanese. She knows a lot of that history. Um, but, but yes, please don't get the impression somehow that only old white guys were doing astronomy. <laughs> this time, lots of different people were doing astronomy. Um, a lot of it wasn't written down, and then um, I'm just not personally as familiar with those stories. But yeah, really great question. Thank you. So I'm intrigued by that map of the eclipses and not including 
uh, the most recent one that we had, and you said that's uh, the Sorrows uh, model or something. I don't understand. What What are you talking about? Yeah, this is a <laughs> this is a subject of a whole talk actually. Um, basically, what happens is that eclipses take place over the course of uh, they take place as a series of different eclipses that all resemble one another in certain important ways. So as the, as the moon circles around the Earth, the orbit of the moon actually changes over time. And so as the moon's orbit drifts, uh, each subsequent eclipse that we see from one eclipse to the next will be slightly different. But there's a 16-year uh, there's a, a year, 16 year, right, cycle when one eclipse will resemble a previous eclipse. And each eclipse in that 16-year cycle uh, forms an eclipse in, in a particular Saros cycle. Um, so it, to be honest, it's a little complicated and technical to explain, and um, I don't have the slides to explain it. But, but yeah, so the idea is basically that each of the eclipses that happens here, the moon and the sun are about in the same place in the sky. Um, and they, they comprise uh, eclipses in the Saros cycle. It's fascinating. This goes back to the Babylonians as well. Saros is a, is, uh, goes back to the Babylonians' as cycle. So there are a number of cycles then? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, they're not, and then the Saros cycles themselves can drift a bit. Um, it's, very, it's, it's really fascinating kind of overlapping tapestries of different uh, uh, oscillations and frequencies uh, in the orbital motion. It's really fascinating, but, but a little, tech, a little co complicated. Yeah, great question. Yes, please. Near the very beginning where you talked about the um, moon orbiting a planet, the first one that was found, and it's controversial whether the moon actually exists. How do you know this? How, how do we figure out the size of the moon? Yeah, this is a great question. How do we figure out the size of the moon? So that dip, the really big dip in the center, that, that, that's a real planet. We know that that's the shadow of a real planet. And uh, as you might imagine, how deep the shadow from that planet is depends on how big the planet is compared to its star. So when you have a really, really big planet around a really teeny star, you're going to get a really, really big shadow. And that's, that's the essence of it. We basically see how big is that shadow, um, and that tells us how big the planet is. And so we can use the same technique to try to guess at the size of the, the satellite, a partial transit for which you can see on that right-hand side there. Yeah, this is still, like I say, the subject of a lot of controversy. Um, as you can see, in the middle there, we have a really nice kind of symmetric dip. It goes down and comes right back up. That is what we would say is a complete transit. So it's a very clear, robust signal. You can see the little dip on the right-hand side. It's only partial. It's only partial. And that's because uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, which took its observations, didn't manage to watch for a full cycle of this planetary system. Um, and why didn't it watch for a full cycle? Because it's very hard to get time on the Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> and so they, they, they dole it out in very small quantities. And the, the, the astronomers who made this observation didn't know exactly when the star, when the planet and the, the satellite might pass in front of the star. So they, they made their best guess. And they were off by a little bit. So they're trying to get more data now. Yes. And when did you say that observation was made? Oh, somebody was asking me this. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> this is, I think, just last year, actually. Oh, this so is very recent. recent. Very recent. Okay. Yeah. I should know off the top of my head, but I'm sorry, I don't. Yeah, I think it was just last it year. Was like years ago. No, no, no. This is not an eight. This is, this is cutting edge. Yeah. In the back. How many Earth-sized uh, planets or candidates for life now that have been found in, with all these different studies? Yes, this is a great question. How many, how many Earth-sized, Earth-like planets that might be candidates for life do we know about? Um, let me start with how many planets that we know about. So we've been observing extrasolar planets, planets outside of our solar system, for decades now. They're still pretty hard to find, but we've gotten pretty good at it. Um, and we now know that, on average, for every star in the Milky Way, there's one planet. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that every single star has a planet, but it means that for every star that has no planets, there's another star that has two planets. So every time you look at the night sky, keep that number in mind. Every star has, a, on average, every star has one planet around it. Okay. This now, is within our galaxy. In our galaxy. So that means that there's hundreds of billions of planets in our galaxy. And then of course there's hundreds of billions of galaxies, so just let, try to run through all that math. Um, <laughs> but most of those, a lot of those planets that we know about in other solar systems are not like the Earth. Most of them are actually much bigger than the Earth. Much of, most of them are actually much closer to the Earth, uh, to their sun, than the Earth is to our sun. And that's because we're much better at finding 
big planets close to their star. As you might expect, those are the easiest ones to find. But we have found a couple, we have found many, many Earth-sized planets in sort of Earth-like orbits. And we now think that something like um, a quarter, a quarter of all sun-like stars in the galaxy host Earth-like planets. A quarter. Okay. So, one, two, three, four stars. One of those stars has an Earth-like planet around it. Now, we don't know that any of those planets has life on them. We haven't seen any clear signals of life on another planet yet. Um, but uh, Ellen Sofan, who's, who's NASA's chief scientist, has suggested that within the next decade or two, we're going to see evidence for life on another planet. So I, I think, yeah, within the lifetimes of, of most of the people in this room, all of the people in this room, hopefully, we're going to know about life on another <coughs> planet. So, yeah, it's a really exciting time. How would we detect life on other planets? That's a whole, you got to come take to my class this fall. <laughs> That's what we talk about. Um, yeah, we, we don't, the short answer is we don't know. We don't know. We have some ideas about what might life might look like on another planet, and a lot of those ideas are are um, motivated by our understanding of life on the Earth. But of course, life on another planet might not look like terrestrial life. Um, and so, mostly right now, we've developed techniques to find life on other planets that resembles the Earth life. What are they looking for? Oxygen. What are they looking for? So, so things that you might look for are oxygen. So, oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. Most of the air on the Earth uh, is nitrogen, like 70% is nitrogen, about 20% is oxygen. Um, if you were to turn off all the green plants on the Earth, just flick a switch and make them stop working tomorrow, the oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere uh, would quickly erode because it's very chemically reactive. It, actually, it would actually disappear from the atmosphere over the course of hundreds or thousands of years. And so plant life on the Earth is actually what maintains the oxygen. And so we think... It's not for certain, but we think that if you saw oxygen in the atmosphere of a distant planet, that would tell you that there was photosynthetic plant life there, at least. Um, we would look for oxygen. We would look for methane. Methane is also a biomolecule, we might we think. It can be, anyway. We want to look for water. Um, so there's a couple of different things we think you might want to look for, but the truth is we don't know exactly what to look for, because we don't know what life on another planet will look like. Yeah. I think I saw a hand right back here. Yes? Okay. Uh, did, um, because I know that the Babylonians were the first to count the 12-month calendar, did the Egyptians have anything similar, or did that... Yeah, they, they had a very similar calendar. Um, th there's a 12-month calendar because, um, there are 12 constellations in the zodiac. Right. Um, and so, uh, the Egyptians had a similar calendar, al although, um... Shout, is that good enough? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, but they had a very interesting um, uh, calendar system. Um, and in fact, the Egyptian calendar system, um, it said that the number of days in the year was 360. Exactly 360. And then there were five days at the end that they took as a festival. Okay. So, so they took that as a festival. They didn't count that as part of their calendar. Uh, but you may know that the exact number of days in a year is 365.242, depending on how you count it. It's a, it's a little fraction of a day left over every year. And so um, the way that we deal with that fraction of a day is every four or so years, we have a leap year, right? Mm -hmm. The Egyptians didn't care about that. They didn't incorporate leap years. And so what would happen is that their months would actually drift over the course of the decades. And so during one span of time, January would be a winter month, and then many, many years later, January would be a summer month. <laughs> they just didn't care about that. They, that didn't bother them at all. Eventually, of course, the Greeks, they, they decided they wanted to have months line up with seasons, and so they began to incorporate more sophisticated calendars. Eventually, the, uh, the Catholic Church uh, developed the, uh, the Gregorian calendar that we use today, which incorporates uh, a leap year. Uh, okay, so do you know the, the rule about when the, when the leap year is? Okay. There's no by four, but... Yeah, so th there's a there's a leap year in a year if that year is divisible by four, unless it's divisible by a hundred, in which case there's not a leap year, unless it's also divisible by four hundred, in which case there is a leap year. <laughs> and so this system allows us to keep our calendars and our, our months and our years synced up over the course of thousands of years, which is really important if you're the Catholic Church and you always want to celebrate Easter in the spring and not the winter, right? 
Um, this calendar, though, uh, is slowly getting out of sync with the day because it turns out that the moon is slowing the rotation of the Earth just a little bit, a few milliseconds every year. But over the course of centuries, thousands and thousands of years, the, our calendar will again drift out of sync with the days. Uh, and so we actually incorporate what's called a leap second every so often. So there's a leap second that we incorporate every so often to account for the fact that the days are actually slowing down. The days are slowing down. <laughs> Now, I read something on the internet last week with respect to the acceleration of the universe and described as a crisis that the Hubble constant prediction is actually that the universe is accelerating faster than what they predicted. Uh, so the question is about uh, the acceleration of the universe. Uh, you may know that uh, all the galaxies in the universe, almost all of them, are actually moving apart from one another. So they're, they're, they're moving away from one another at very, very high rates of speed. And the farther a galaxy is away from our galaxy, the faster it's moving away from our galaxy. Okay. So the whole universe is expanding. And it turns out that that expansion is not just constant that way. It doesn't, it's not just that galaxies further away from us are moving faster away. There's actually an acceleration of that motion. Uh, that acceleration is driven by something called dark energy. We have no idea what dark energy is. <laughs> we don't know. But whatever it is, it causes the, this universal expansion to accelerate. Um, I, I don't know whether you would consider that to be a crisis. I'm not sure. But they, they described it as a crisis. Yeah, yeah. So, so we do not understand what's driving that acceleration. We just label it as dark energy because we don't know what, to call it, what else to call it. Um, and and it, I guess in some sense it represents a crisis for our understanding of the universe because yeah, we don't understand that. So it's true. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what some people say is a crisis, astronomers would say uh, is a good... Uh, Grant funding opportunity. <laughs> so does that say that even Andromeda is moving up further no, away? No, uh, the galaxies that are very close to us are actually moving toward the Milky Way. So that's why I said most galaxies are moving away from one another. But not all. We're, we're getting very close to the Andromeda galaxy. And I think something like, oh, I don't know off the top of my head, tens of millions of years it's going to crash into our galaxy. Uh, don't worry, that will not be a crisis. <laughs> the distance between the stars is enormous, and so galaxies crash into each other all the time, but the, the stars never crash into each other. Almost never crash into each other. <laughs> 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 other, other questions? Um, do we have one more question? Yes. So, you've been studying uh, the rocks in Death Valley, or is that just totally different something? Oh, uh, yeah, so our group uh, spent several years studying uh, rocks on, on racetrack Playa in Death Valley. Um, you can visit racetrackplaya.org. <laughs> we have a website there that describes this. But briefly, uh, there are rocks on this dry lake bed in Death Valley that move around on their own. Um, and for a, a hundred years, people had, had seen them leave trails in the muddy surface of this lake bed. But no one had ever seen them move until just a few years ago when our group caught them in motion on camera. No, I'll just direct you to the website. You can find out about it there. <laughs> we have videos on that website. So. Great. Thanks so much for coming out. Please come to the stargazing event tonight. All right. Thank you all so much for coming out this evening. Um, if you enjoyed tonight's program, become a member. Donate. Become a part of our history with this uh, here brick path that we also have information on. If you have questions about our organization or any of our programs, us people in the blue shirts are uh, more than willing to answer any of your questions. Um, thank you so much. Come to the Sky Party tonight. Next week we're going to have Russ Throw talk about, uh, his title is Born to be Wild. It's about the Chinook salmon in our salmon river right here behind you guys. Um, and then on Saturday we'll have the Salmon Festival from 11 to 6, right where you guys are sitting again. You could even sleep here. Just kidding. No, I'm sleeping. Um, thank you all so much for coming out tonight, and have a wonderful day. Yeah, Sarah, goes, is that at the park? The stargazing at the park? Yep, it's at the park. Yeah. Nine, nine, three. We'll be there closer to nine. Oh, again. Yeah, yeah. Well, at least it makes it until the end. I don't know. It's not a bad uh, we're going to try. <laughs>
You get that? I think I do actually, honestly. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's mostly over my head. I love it. I know. That's what we're missing, right? I think that guy was waiting for the king of Denmark. Flatter is great because he wouldn't sell.